Good afternoon. I'm Diana Erlob with Peers for Progress, and I want to welcome you to our first webinar of 2014 for the National Peer Support Collaborative Learning Network. The network is funded through Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation's Together on Diabetes Initiative and is co-led by Peers for Progress and the National Council of La Raza. The network is focused on developing and sharing evidence of benefits of peer support programs, best practices, effective evaluation methods, models of organizing peer support within health systems, as well as effective models of advocacy. Today's webinar is titled, Peers for Safe Talk, Can a Motivational Interviewing-Based Safer Sex Program for People Living with HIV Be Adapted for Peer Delivery? Featuring Carol Golan and Marlon Alicop with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Now I'd like to hand things over to Ed Fisher, uh, the Global Director of Peers for Progress, who will talk more about our work and introduce our, part, our speakers. Thank you, Diana. It's sure. really a pleasure to uh, talk with you all this afternoon and to introduce two wonderful people doing really exciting work in uh, HIV and motivational interviewing and peer support. Um, our speakers this afternoon are Carol Golan, who is a colleague here at University of North Carolina in our School of Public Health and our School of Medicine. Uh, Carol uh, got her medical degree here at the University of North Carolina, uh, was a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Fellow, and uh, is a uh, head of the Community Outreach Corps of our uh, AIDS Research Center here at UNC Chapel Hill and has been a real leader in community-oriented uh, approaches to HIV uh, uh, in here in a variety of areas. Uh, she's done work, for example, in working with prison populations on HIV prevention and management. Uh, the other um, uh, presenter is Marilyn Alacock, who has uh, got her PhD here in, in our Department of Health Behavior at uh, the School of Public Health here at UNC. Uh, worked with uh, Carol and a number of colleagues here, not only in HIV, but also in cancer and nutrition and health promotion, and is now uh, on faculty in the uh, Division of Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences in the School of Public uh, Health at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Dallas. Um, and so Marlon is continuing to collaborate with Carol on this uh, project that they're going to be describing this afternoon. So uh, a tremendous opportunity we have today, and I'm going to turn it over to Carol and Marlon, and thank you very much uh, for taking the time to present to us on your work. OK, great. Well, thank you um, so much, Ed um, and Diane, and, and to all of the um, Oh, my screen. Um, to, to all of the attendees, um, really delighted and very excited um, to be able to both share with you some of the work we've been doing in this area and have a discussion with you um, about um, sort of your views and your opinions um, regarding the work that we've been doing. Um, so I'm very um, grateful to, to Ed um, for inviting us to participate in this and present this webinar. So um, just to start out, um, we just wanted to give you a, a brief overview of what Marlon and I um, sort of hope to achieve during the webinar. Um, the first thing I just I think need to describe the Safe Talk program, which is a safer sex program for people living with HIV. Um, that we developed and that we then um, are interested in potentially adapting to be peer delivered. And um, so just describing that program and the evidence um, of its impact on safer sex behaviors so um, you have a sense of what we're talking about. That program is based on motivational interviewing. And so as part of that, I'd like to explain a little bit about what motivational interviewing is and how we used it in the Safe Talk program. Um, and then we'd like to spend most of the time leading a discussion and presenting some preliminary data related to that discussion on how Safe Talk could be 
um, adapted for delivery by peers. Um, and some of the things that we will um, do as a part of that, um, we did a series of focus groups with people living with HIV. So I'll show you a little bit of results from that about what were patients' opinions, people living with HIV, what were their opinions of a peer safe talk? What did they think was a good idea, a bad idea? What, did, what would they prefer with regard to a peer delivered safe talk? And then Marlon's going to talk a bit about um, a pilot safe talk peer training we did based on some of the information we got in the focus groups. And throughout both of those presentations, we'll stop at certain points and um, have a discussion with all of us about different things that um, we considered or that you think maybe we should or should have or should going forward consider for adapting this type of program for peer delivery. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about, well, why did we even develop the Safe Talk program? Um, so there was, um, at the time, and still is, a substan um, evidence that a substantial proportion of people living with HIV report practicing unsafe sex. And in fact, most people when diagnosed with HIV greatly reduce risky sexual behavior, but there's still a minority that's substantial who continue to practice unsafe sex. Um, the second thing that we knew was that studies uh, had shown that multiple factors influence safer sex practices of people living with HIV. Sexual behavior is quite complex, and so, of course, it's influenced by many things. And so, as a result, we knew that safer sex programs, um, particularly for people living with HIV, really had to be able to address multiple risk factors because some things may be salient for one individual but not for another. Um, and so it really needs to be a flexible and multi-pronged approach to help people practice safer sex. Um, motivational interviewing, which I will be telling you about um, in, in just a little bit here, um, was the approach we considered because um, it is a theory-grounded and very client-centered counseling style. And that gives it an, a particularly individualized nature. Um, and so this individualized nature of motivational interviewing, we felt, um, would be likely to facilitate this type of behavior that needs to be addressed um, in a complex, multi-dimensional way. Um, and um, in addition, we knew that sort of multi-component behavioral pro behavior change programs uh, there's quite a lot of evidence showing that multi-component programs would be more effective than just a single component program, particularly when we're talking about a complex behavior like this. Um, so it, it made good sense. And so we developed, um, based on that, the safe talk, that, the, that sort of rationale, the safe talk program. And I'll, I'll just, here, I'll just describe it to you briefly and then, and then show you a little bit more about it. So it is, ba it is theoretically based. Um, it, based on social cognitive theory. Um, it entails four monthly motivational interviewing safe for sex counseling sessions with, and these were delivered by um, master's level trained counselors. They were not only already trained as counselors, but then they underwent a week long training with us in the Safe Talk motivational interviewing program, how to deliver it. Um, it has a standardized 13-step motivational interviewing safer sex program protocol. So it's, it's, it's sort of manualized and standardized. Um, and the whole program um, focuses, being based in social cognitive theory, it focuses on raising awareness of an individual, of their self-motivation to practice safer sex, as well as to enhance their skills and their self-efficacy to practice safer sex. Now, in addition to these four monthly counseling sessions, we also developed, as I'll show you in a moment, a CV booklet pair to precede each MI or motivational interviewing session. And these were interactive CVs and booklets that prepared the individual for each motivational interviewing session by using patient narratives and exercises that the um, client would go through before the session and then bring to the session. And then in addition, following the session, um, they received a tailored booster letter from their counselor, um, sort of 
um, reminding them what had taken place in the session and what they what their plans had been, and um, talking about looking forward to following up with them in the next session. So that's part of what we mean by multi-component, is that there were CDs, there were booklets, there were letters, in addition to the counseling session. And they all were designed to work together. This just shows you a little bit about the some of the materials we had. So here's you know one page in the booklet, a menu of choices so they could choose what they wanted to talk about. And then they rated how important and how um, confident they were about talking about this with their counselor. And this was all sort of packaged in a nice little package. They were given a CD, um, ROM, a player, Walkman, I guess you would call it. Um, nowadays, we would, I guess, have to do um, you know, a, a pot streaming podcast or something. Um, and the booklets were all designed to go in that little um, holder there that was opaque and, and, and dark colored because HIV can be a stigmatizing condition, and so we didn't want to draw attention to um, to the materials. And so this allowed people who wanted to to keep them private. Um, so that's a little bit about an overview of the program, um, what it entailed. Um, and some of the materials. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit, and Marlon will talk more about motivational interviewing in her session, section. But um, I want to talk a little bit about what motivational interviewing is um, to set up our discussion about, you know, well, how amenable is this to peer delivery? So first of all, I like to point out um, when explaining motivational interviewing that it's not just a new idea. Um, and so in this, I learned this from Steve Rolnick, who is one of the founders of one of the two founders of motivational interviewing, and I underwent a training with him, and he showed this quote from Pascal from the 17th century. And as you can see, people, he said, people are generally better persuaded by the reasons they have themselves discovered than by those which have come into the mind of others. And um, so this is the idea, very simply, that, uh, and I think it resonates with all of us, that if somebody tells us to do something, we're probably less likely to do it and maybe likely, more likely to not even want to do it, um, depending on how they say it, um, than if we think of it ourselves, if it comes into our own mind first. And so th this is the basic idea underlying motivational interviewing. And, and here is a description of sort of how motivational interviewing works, and you can see it sounds quite similar. Patients should be encouraged to produce arguments for change and ways of achieving it rather than having these arguments presented to them by the practitioner. So the idea is you, you talk to people, you listen to them, um, and hear their own reasons for why they want to change, why they may want to practice safer sex rather than telling them this, what they need to do. So that's sort of a simple idea. And so the definition then from there of motivational interviewing is that it is a directive but client-centered counseling style for eliciting behavior change by helping clients to explore and resolve ambivalence. And that's a mouthful, um, and it may sound contradictory. So it, it is directive. So we said it's not telling people what to do. And that's true, but at the same time, in the back of our minds, we do think that, you know, that practicing safer sex is healthier for them and healthier for the, the public um, and public health. Um, so we have a direction in mind, but we're not going to tell them to go in that direction. We're going to be client-centered about it and allow them to tell themselves. The other key um, to this is that it's done by helping them explore and resolve ambivalence. So generally, for health-related behaviors, people are of two minds. They feel ambivalent. Part of them wants to practice safer sex, and part of them doesn't. And helping them explore that, their own feelings and their own views, is the basis of motivational interviewing. Um, and the idea is that by doing that, it actually moves people forward towards healthy change. Um, Motivational interviewing has been identified as having four um, kind of key components or aspects or processes. Um, and these are engaging, focusing, evoking, and planning. And so by engaging, we're talking about um, the process, 
essentially of establishing a mutually trusting and respectful working relationship with an individual. Um, so there's a variety of techniques that are used in motivational interviewing, like other counseling styles, um, that um, create this engaging process. The second process of motivational interviewing is called focusing. And so this is sort of an ongoing process of helping someone seek and maintain a direction. The, the third one, evoking, is talking about helping the person, and this is what we were just talking about, move towards behavior change um, by the natural process of evoking their thoughts and feelings about the ambivalence they have regarding, say, in this case, safer sex behavior. And by helping them talk about that um, and reflect back on that, um, they will be able to resolve that ambivalence, and that will move them towards change. And then the final one is planning, and this is probably the more um, understandable. This is about really being present with someone while they are forming a feasible change plan for themselves in a direction that they want to go. So, um, so those are the four elements of, of, or four processes of motivational interviewing, and these were part of the 13 steps that we used in the Safe Talk program. Now I just want to show you a little bit about what we found when we um, used this approach in Safe Talk with people living with HIV. We did a, a randomized controlled trial um, at 13, uh, sorry, three different clinics with um, about 500 people living with HIV in North Carolina. We, uh, as I said, it's a control trial, and the control group got New Leaf, which was a heart-healthy exercise and diet program. Um, and this slide just sort of shows you who participated in the um, study. Um, you can see about the mean age was about 42.7. About 70% of people in the study were African American, which is reflective of the clinics um, where we conducted the study. And um, about 26%, 25%, but a quarter had less than a high school education, relatively high proportion with low income and, and not working, um, and then some information about their diagnosis. Um, most of them have been diagnosed more than a year, and a great many even 10 years or more. Um, and this just shows you the results. TRB stands for um, transmission risk behavior. So this is having unprotected anal or vaginal intercourse um, with someone who's at risk, either HIV negative or they don't know their status. Um, and as you can see, at eight months, the blue is the control and the red is the um, intervention. And you can see that the control actually slightly increased their risky behavior, whereas the um, intervention group um, um, greatly decreased their risky behavior at eight months, which was our primary outcome point. And this was highly statistically significant. And this is unprotected anal or vaginal intercourse with, with either, um, with anyone, whether they were HIV positive or, or HIV negative or unknown. Um, but we saw the same result at, um, at eight months. It's interesting that some of the control group actually by 12 months had um, actually improved, reduced their risky behavior as well. Um, but the difference was still statistically significant between them. So what did we find? Well, motivational interviewing delivered to HIV-positive patients monthly in, in the clinic setting enhanced by audiovisual materials can provide an effective prevention intervention for a heterogeneous group of people living with HIV. And in fact, this um, intervention has actually been, uh, was picked up by the CDC and evaluated and has been now listed on their website as one of their evidence-based interventions um, for HIV prevention. Um, and we think that this individualized nature of MI and the tailored nature of the materials allow the counselors to target the program to each client's unique needs and behaviors. And we have some analyses that we've done to suggest that's the case. So we had a program that works, but um, and we have, you know, based on evidence, but dissemination um, can be challenging for a variety of reasons, not, not the least of which is that it could be very expensive for every clinic to suddenly have to have a couple of master's level um, counselors available, and how would this be paid for? 
So um, that brought us to thinking about a lot of different ways that we might um, disseminate this program. And one of them was, would it be something that would be appropriate for peer delivery? Um, and I'll, uh, so I'll just throw out some of the questions we had. And then I think, um, as Diane said, we could open things up so that people could raise their hands and we might be able to um, have a bit um, um, of a discussion. I'd love to get your opinions and share with you some of the thoughts we had at the time. So things we were thinking about were, you know, how well could Safe Talk be peer delivered? Um, what are the advantages of peer delivery? You know, what might we gain that we, we couldn't do um, the way we had done it uh, with the counselors? But what might be some disadvantages of peer delivery, things that we might lose by changing this? Could, and could peers even learn and apply these motivational interviewing skills? Um, yes, it took, a, it took a week to train uh, skilled counselors to do it. You know, what would it, is it something we'd be able to, peers would be able to learn? And then what, how should we define peer? And I suspect this is something that you all struggle with in your own work or have struggled with in developing your programs. Is a peer just anyone who's HIV positive? Is it, should we match on gender or length of diagnosis or, you know, maybe it's not someone who even who's HIV positive, but who has a lot of the risk factors for HIV. Um, and so, what, what is a peer, um, and, and how do we find them? So, I'm going to stop here with these questions and open things up to to Marlin and to, but more importantly, to all of you participating in the webinar and and get your thoughts um, about how you think this this might work or might have worked or could work. Yeah, and I think we're um, we're really interested um, to learn, you know, some of what you all may have struggled with in terms of defining peers. I know a lot of people probably on the the call or the webinar work in peer programs, work with peers, perhaps are peers, um, and so I'd be interested to know your experience about some of the advantages of peer delivery. Um, are there any downsides? Well, we have a, a hand raised. This is, um, I think I'm saying it right, Maria Elena. She's saying, um, I work with the Latin American Community Center in Wilmington, Delaware. There's a program called Promotoras de Salud. Mm. She's still typing. Sure, and I mean, I can just, while, while she's typing in, hopefully I won't sure. preempt her comment. Um, and, interrupt me when you have it, but I can just share, you know, some of what we felt like the advantages of peer delivery would be this sort of sense of understand, you know, a deeper sense of understanding and empathy, which is a big part of motivational interviewing, um, of having gone through similar experiences. Um, but we really did have concerns, I think, about, you know, would these skills be, would someone who's not a trained counselor be able to learn these skills? Mm -hmm. And also, one of the concerns we had is that many patients with HIV, about 70% in our clinics have either um, a mental illness or um, substance abuse history or both. And so, you know, would that somehow interfere with their being able to put their own concerns aside? Mm -hmm. Or would it make them more empathic or both, you know, and how do we sift through all that? So, so those are some mm -hmm. of the concerns that we had. Yeah, she's, so I think it's a comment mostly, and she's saying uh -huh. that um, she works in the Latin American Community Center in Wilmington, Delaware. There's a program called Promotores de Salud, which tries to take lay people and teach them accurate info about different chronic diseases. One of the difficulties is in finding motivated lay people who can commit the time to learn the information and health messaging we want communicated about diabetes, hypertension, etc. However, one of the strengths is in hearing best practices from people who are in the same position and have the same diseases, live in the same area, or socioeconomic, socioeconomic stresses. So mm -hmm. it sounds like she's just really talking about some of the pros and cons of working mm -hmm. with peers. Um, you have the benefit of, you know, someone who's in the same position, but sometimes it can be hard to find those people. 
um, mm. to participate in the being a peer. That's, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. I appreciate um, your sharing that, Marielena. Um, in some ways, maybe a similar population of people in a sense in terms of socioeconomic status with whom we work, and so some of the issues about um, you know, about about the, not just the motivation, but the capacity to actually have the time and to commit and that kind of thing. Yeah. Other competing demands. It's yeah. That's a really good point that we haven't okay. actually thought about. Yeah, and Carol, I think also so, uh, that um, this is Marlon, that um, also in the focus groups you're about to talk a little bit about um, that issue came up about the length of commitment that peers mm -hmm. to make and whether mm -hmm. it might be a disadvantage to keep having to recruit um, continually if people um, fall off or if time commitment sort of um, finishes. So that's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. We have one more question with the hand raised, and if you want, we can take this last question, and then you guys can go ahead and move forward. That sounds perfect. Okay. Natalie, are you there? Well, she also submitted her question online, so I'll go ahead and just read it. Um, she says, I think the program can be delivered by peers. However, the peers need to be trained in motivational interviewing, and that is time consuming. Have you thought of creating a manual for health promoters or peers? Mm. That's great. And we're, as Marlon said, we're going to sort of get to that. And so um, I think this is all, um, these are great comments and okay. sort of food for thought. He's keeping these questions in mind and we'll sort of walk you through. And then at the end we have, um, Marlon's going to sort of uh, elicit some more discussion around some, some similar issues. So we conducted, as I said, we conducted some focus groups to try to understand some of this so that we could actually develop a training for peers that involved a manual, and, and Marlon will describe that, but I just thought I'd share with you a little bit about what the focus group participants said. Um, and it's basically we have three main themes to share. One was, the first point was all participants felt peer-delivered safe talk would be beneficial. They really liked the idea, it resonated really well with them, they were excited about it. And here's some quotes to show you the kinds of comments. It, I felt like if it would have, and there, this person's talking about like if, if they could have had someone like this in the past, I felt like it would have been someone that was positive, meaning HIV positive, they could have been more sympathetic, just like when you first found out. That, so saying that it would be really help, would have been helpful to have somebody when, it, when they first found out. And this one says, I mean, I would love to be able to, when I'm feeling like crap, go to the phone and call somebody who has been dealing with it as long as I have or longer. And another one said, it's, it's you. It's, it's like looking in the mirror. It's you. They're right there with you. And they've had that same scary moment of, oh, my God, I'm positive. So this re that idea really resonated with them, as some people said, about you know, understanding. The other thing, though, one of the concerns was breach of confidentiality. And I don't know if this is such a big issue in diabetes or whatever, but for HIV, it's a big concern. So one person said, I think it's a great idea as long as they are trained and the key word confidential, confidential, confidential. And they have proven themselves that they can be confidential. And someone else said, disclosing the information to someone else that um, break their confidentiality agreement. And the interview says that the peer might break that, and they say, yeah, that's in other words, that's what they were worried about. And then the final theme was that they talked a lot about, I mean, we asked them about this, what characteristics would they want in a peer counselor? And then they talked about religion. Um, some people thought um, religion could get in the way. Another person said, it's not important as, you know, if you're different religions, that could get in the way. But this person said, it's not important as long as they don't say, stop taking your meds, that's not the way, Jesus is the way. As long as they don't say something like that, then now we're good. So that person didn't mind if the person was religious. The sort of, most of the feeling was if, if they're religious, as long as they don't try to impose their religion on me, if I'm religious, as long as they don't judge me for my religion, we'll be okay. Um, some people, I won't even go through this quote, but some people thought age might matter. If they're not age matched, they might, it might, they might not listen to each other. But others said, I don't think age, it's age matters. I mean, for me, it would have have to be somebody who has had it longer than me. So it was the experience rather than the age. Um, and then the idea of emotional health that I mentioned, um, I would want the person to be emotionally fit to take in whatever that peer is telling them. I wouldn't want anybody to listen to my story and then break down crying. 
And then other characteristics they mentioned were honesty, being non-judgmental, being a good listener, and not telling the person what to do, which was really interesting since that is a part of the Safe Talk approach. So now I'm going to turn it over to Marlin, and she's going to talk a little bit about the um, training that we did do based on based on those focus groups. Great. Thanks, Carol. And Carol, you're actually going to be controlling my slides, so you don't. Oh, right. Um, and so it's a pleasure to be here. So I just want to spend the next few minutes just talking a little bit more about our pilot training and how and why we incorporated MIA-based communication. So Carol, just summarize some of the needs that our focus group participants expressed regarding what would work well in a peer support context, which we believe is a good fit for a motivational interviewing approach to behavior change and in providing support through a counseling session. So our goal is really to emphasize the spirit of motivational interviewing and teach communication skills to actually support that. And the four aspects that in encompass the spirit of motivational interviewing that we included in our training are this idea of partnership or a collaborative approach, where the counseling session would absolutely not be something where it's just a counselor uh, or an expert um, doing something up to a passive recipient. It's an active collaboration between the counselor and the patient, keeping in mind that the patient is the person who actually knows him or herself best, and the counselor would not be able to change safe sex practices nor does the counselor have all the right answers or solution based on their, their previous expertise or background. And this idea, the second piece of developing intrinsic motivation, um, and motivational interviewing um, does not work from a deficiency model. It recognizes that each person actually has a powerful, innate potential to grow in positive direction. directions. Therefore, the counselor, the task of the counselor is really to unleash that potential or motivation and to help facilitate the natural change process that's already inherent. And related to this idea of um, intrinsic motivation, um, well, the idea of partnership is um, an attitude of acceptance about where what the patient actually brings to the table, so meeting the person where there is. And acceptance um, does not mean that a counselor is actually endorsing or approving of the, uh, the patient's behavior of having unprotected sex per se, the counselor's approval or disapproval is not really relevant at all. It's really the idea of being non-judgmental um, in that moment. And the interest is really in understanding the patient's point of view. And the final uh, piece that we incorporate is this uh, appreciation for ambivalence. That behavior change is really difficult. And this involves helping people resolve the, in the ambivalence that often entraps them. And, um, and this requires really listening to, acknowledging, and practicing acceptance of a broad range of the patient's concerns, beliefs, and motivations, even when the counselor um, doesn't agree um, with the patient's perspective. Next slide. And so um, the spirit of mo uh, motivation interviewing is really manifested through the use of specific um, skills and techniques. And this list that we have here um, represents the full list that uh, was taught in the original um, Safe Talk program. And the ones that are in red are the skills that we actually use to, we use to teach um, the peers. And this is actually, we simplified it for this audience um, based on some of our other work, um, training uh, peers to use motivational interviewing. So it was really distilled. So we wanted to focus on open questions, really teaching our participants how to use open questions with patients to encourage getting more information focusing on reflective listening and learning that skill, which is, is a skill that truly gets us trying to understand what is being said. What, what are the meanings that people are presenting? Um, the third piece is uh, the importance and confidence rulers um, and tools that we use to understand how and why engaging in a particular behavior might or might not be important for that, um, for that patient. Focusing on potential barriers, gaining an understanding of, an understanding of the patient's core values, to focus on the things that actually motivate, um, to help build rapport with the patient, to help the patient gain clarity for decision making. I'm really trying to use um, the skills, these communication skills, to talk to the patient about what, what plans, if any, that they might have for dealing with um, safer sex issues. And finally, um, focus on helping um, our trainees to really summarize the session that they would have with the patients about what decisions were made during that session, what concerns, what challenges, what strength and motivation, et cetera. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So um, our uh, pilot training was actually conducted in uh, Durham, North Carolina. We had six peers, all African-Americans, uh, included two men. 
none of them had any previous history of a, uh, peer counseling or counseling experience. Um, their fairly older age population, the average age was 50, uh, with an age range of 39 to 65. The average um, years of diagnosis have been uh, 13 years, so people living uh, have lived fairly a long time with the disease. And so we also um, did our recruitment in collaboration with um, some community partners and area clinics. One of the things that came up in our focus groups was this idea, especially for African Americans, that this was still a highly stigmatized uh, disease. And being in Durham and North Carolina area, it was still very, these closed circles that they ran in, and they wanted to be able to feel safe. So it was important for us to collaborate with a partner even to find a training space. So we focused our training on the MI teaching, the skills that I mentioned. We did five days of training. This included weekends. And like our focus group participants, our participants, um, our six participants were really highly interested in receiving this training. And um, they, too, really believed that you know, there was a service that was well needed. So um, how we adapted some of the original protocol from the original study in terms of the training, um, we looked at some of our previous work um, training cancer patients and veterans uh, around different behaviors um, to do peer-to-peer -peer support using motivation engineering. One of the things we knew we had to do was to provide a baseline knowledge regarding the topic, in this case, um, HIV and AIDS. We didn't want to make any assumptions about what knowledge or trainees were bringing. Um, we wanted to make sure they're up to date with the current science. We would get any um, misunderstandings that they had about the disease or treating it that resolved. And that they were at a comfortable um, place with the information. So uh, we also wanted to ensure that we simplify the MI skills, which what I mentioned before, but specifically really staying away from these academic terms that sometimes that including in, in motivation interviewing, such as like the writing reflex, evocation, change talk, developing discrepancy, even though we were doing those things in the training, those weren't things or labels that we put on it. And this wasn't necessarily hinting at the educational level, but rather getting people out of that frame of mind of it being an academic endeavor, so they got stumped and feeling like the conversations needed to be in a specific order, and it wasn't natural. So staying away from those, high, those um, specific terms helped us to sort of focus in on the skills that we needed to, um, to work on. We also thought it was very important, um, based on previous research, that the examples that we used had to be specific to what the issues that we think they would encounter, even though there are many resources out there, including some of the ones we've created for other behaviors, teaching um, motivation engineering um, to peers um, around different topic areas. We did not draw on those um, resources, especially videos and DVDs, because sometimes they get people a little bit tied up and they don't readily make the transition of thinking of how to use that skill within a different context. So wanting to keep the behaviors very specific. We also um, knew we needed to extend the training time and really spend time with that core, the core um, training. In past, issue, past times when we've trained peers, we would have at least a three-day um, training that's focused on the motivation interviewing skills and followed um, throughout the intervention and implementation phase by monthly booster sessions um, for learning. But in this case, we spent a lot of time with the core skills. Um, we spent five days because we really needed more time. And really addressing also this issue of literacy and learning styles. And so we use a lot of diagrams, lots of illustrations, lots of role plays, lots of small group work, a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one, um, work we also did. And so this is just, um, how we value the training. Um, we did pre and post tests to assess um, confidence and skills acquired. We had a member of our staff, our research team, observe all of our training so we can understand verbal and nonverbal cues of what was working, what wasn't working, so that we can immediately either change something or tweak something or follow it up in the, in the following session. We also debriefed every um, session, and we also recorded um, two sets of practice conversations with our trainees, um, with a member of our research team where the trainee was the counselor and it was audio recorded. And we used Mighty um, Treatment Code to provide structured, formal feedback about the ways to improve the communication skills. And this is really to focus on the counselor behavior. Um, so we wanted to see whether they would be MI proficient. So this is what we did. 
So we, we don't have time in this session to really talk specifically about our results, and we're still sort of um, working through some of those. But I wanted to provide you with a broad brushstroke of some of the lessons I think um, learned just in um, doing the small pilot, and that we do believe that the motivation interviewing based communication skills are really practical to help in a system of peer support. One of the things um, we this time very challenging is this idea, and we've seen it with other groups that we've trained, on learning previous communication styles, such as really advice giving, can be very challenging. So really having to spend time up front to really decon deconstruct why telling someone what to do may not be the best approach. And oftentimes this is based on what people have learned because they were told, oh, you know, you need to stay on your medicine, and that's what they did. Um, and so they, you know, just understanding why that approach may not always be effective in meeting um, the client where they were. We thought of profession, proficiency levels in terms of the MI skills varied. Um, so there was always going to be some folks who never really uh, pick up all of the skills, but it raises the question about the type and amount of training that's actually required. So in addition to us providing um, individual feedback and helping um, our trainees do some self-assessment, doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring, um, and any remediation protocols, we're yet to still, I think, understand who are the best and least effective at learning motivational interview-based communication and whether the type or the amount of training may need to actually vary. We also did notice some of the skills that diminished um, with some time lapse, which is not surprising. The, the sessions between our fourth and fifth training, there was a month, um, I think, um, gap in there. We noticed some of these skills diminishing. And so this also raises a question. And we also know that it needs to be, once people are trained, there needs to be continued training and supervision. But what is the optimal amount that's actually needed? So that's something um, um, that needs to be explored. And I think this brings us to some of the broader discussion, discussion questions that we have. And I know we're running a little bit short on time. But we wanted to pose these questions as a way, um, just giving you, after giving you a flavor of um, a little bit of what we did, to sort of explore these issues. How can we really improve safe talk for peers? Is motivation interviewing really too complex to have peers delivered? Um, deliver that, or is it the actual um, behavior of safe sex counseling? Uh, is that too complex for peers? What challenges do HIV infected peers f um, face? Is that different from other peers doing a different behavior? And how is it that we can really identify appropriate peer counselors? So those are some of the questions um, doing this pilot raise, and we had some of these even before we started, and we just love to hear some of your feedback if you have any if it's now or even offline later on before we have I think two more slides to conclude okay um, so you can go ahead if you if you have any questions or comments you can t either type them into the box um, into the text box for questions or you're welcome also to raise your hand and we can see um, we can unmute you Carol do you have any you want to say before we go to the next um, no, I, I, yeah, I, I just I was going to say you did a great job of sort of summarizing a, a broad range of things that we um, experiences that we had and lessons that we've learned in, in doing this with people. Um, and I think you know my take, and I know you're going you're going to move into sort of our next steps, um, but Again, as you said, you know, people, if they want to contact us offline and have thoughts, but I think that what we learned is um, this probably is something that peers can do, but that the training, we need to get better about identifying who is appropriate peer counselor and sort of having a way to screen people in terms of their communication skills, their baseline communication skills and learning skills in advance, and then really plan a more, um, a longer, and more um, in-depth training than we probably initially anticipated. So I would say that that's part of what we learned is that this both the motivational interviewing and the safer sex issue um, are challenging to address. The peers, one thing I think may not have come out, the peers love this. They love the training. They they um, they were the most motivated 
trainees, I think, uh, and we've trained a lot of people to do motivational interviewing. They were the most motivated people I've ever seen to learn motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really, really exciting to see and I think made us want to, you know, maybe even modify what our goals are with peer counseling and take advantage of some of the advantages um, that are there and but also develop strategies to overcome some of the hurdles that we learned about. We have two questions. Um, one of them is, where did you all find your first few peer trainees? Do you want to explain we, that more? Where did we find the trainees? Yes. Um, so we um, worked with um, some area clinics in our hospitals and um, two community-based organizations that um, focus on HIV AIDS work and AIDS care to help identify our, um, potential participants, but also to advertise for us. Okay. And one more. Um, I'm wondering, instead of training peers to deliver the interventions to all patients, have you thought about identifying some patients who may be more suitable for peer interventions? Mm. That's, that's a great point, and I think, Diane, that relates. We hadn't thought about that, but that's something we can definitely think about. But it does relate to a conversation we had earlier about our just thinking about integrating peer the, the peer program, really, you know, a safer sex peer program to the other services that are in the clinic. So sort of finding where they can complement the skills that are already there. And I think part of that could be too finding the patients that either could benefit most or most at need or most amenable to do a, a peer program. So that's a great point that we hadn't thought of. Yeah, so one of the, uh, yeah, one of the things that came up, I think, believe in the focus groups was that uh, peer support might be most suitable, especially for people who are newly diagnosed. You're not shock sort of phase, and that might be a great um, leverage point, a way to intervene at that point, that they can might be most useful. Mm -hmm. That was one. several people suggested that. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great point, too. Okay, well, those are all the questions we have. I think you guys have a couple more slides, or? I think, uh, yeah, Marlon has just. Yeah, I think it's just uh, our one, more. one more slide about where we're going from here um, in terms of um, maybe keeping an eye out for some of the publications that we're going to do based on this work. If you're interested, um, we definitely will be putting out um, our focus group data, uh, publishing that, and talking about some of um, our successes and challenges with the training of, of adapting and testing this training and then hopefully um, the information that we have will be sufficient for us to um, write a larger pilot, do a larger pilot and eventually uh, a larger grant, more randomized control trial um, later on. So that's where we are heading um, in terms of the direct, this direction of, from the things that we've done so far. I think we've gotten um, really good feedback, and we have um, some good data. So we're we're excited about it, and I think, as Carol mentioned, uh, you know, peers really saw in the focus groups and the folks that we trained, they were really excited about it, and really thought this was um, an important aspect for um, th these types of behaviors for this population, and they thought it was would be highly beneficial. Yeah, and the, other, the last thing I want to mention, because um, I um, inadvertently left out my our, our acknowledgments slide, and I can't name everybody who was involved with the Safe Talk program and um, with the Safe Talk for Peers work that Marlon and I did. There was a whole team of people involved, and um, uh, particularly um, Catherine Burdensky and... Um, others on Marlon's team as well. Um, but, so just want to uh, acknowledge and, and thank all the other people who are involved in making this work happen. So, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Carol and Marlon. That was a great webinar.